I should begin by saying, I, with a disclaimer. So as Carmen had mentioned, I'm an engineer. I'm just an engineer. So when I'm speaking about uh, mental health and so forth, I'm speaking you know, without the benefit of being a qualified psychologist uh, you know, who's working in this area. But at the same time, I think that we can also gain insights from neuroscience and uh, about how learning itself can have a really beneficial effect on how we feel. So, um, so I, you know, when they asked me to give this presentation, what I thought was, I'll do a little bit of review of some of the aspects from neuroscience that we know um, have an influence on our mental health. But then I thought well, I'd just open this up so that you can, we can also kind of, uh, kind of converse amongst, our, uh, amongst ourselves about ways we've found to keep a positive mental attitude about different kinds of things, uh, even when we've had really tough times like COVID here. So, um, so I do want to say, to begin with, that we often think that stress is a bad thing. But the reality is that stress isn't always bad. And part of it, as we shall see, depends on how you frame that stress. Uh, but part of it is uh, also just the nature of, it, of stress itself. If you look, you can see that uh, stress, the, the, the hormones that relate to stress that we sort of exude within ourselves when we're in stress, actually, we kind of need a little bit. If we don't get stressed a little bit, we will fall asleep. Life will be super boring. And there's good evidence that people, for example, who um, you know, they have busy lives are really much more cognitively sharp than those who have lives that are kind of more boring and mundane. And sometimes when we retire, we actually don't get as cognitively sharp because we don't receive these kind of daily stresses that we complain about, but that actually can be beneficial for us. Now, too much stress, you know, as for example, if we were sitting here going, is, you know, we're in Ukraine, is a bomb going to come through the, the surface of our, you know, we hear other bombs landing, that's stress. And our body exudes a lot of neurochemicals that are not necessarily, I mean, in the short term, they can make you react really quickly. But if you have these chemicals all the time for an extended period of time, you can, um, it's, it's really not good for your body. I've seen pictures, for example, of, of really happy people um, in, uh, in what was then known as Leningrad, St. Petersburg, before the blockade uh, by the Germans in World War II. And they're just happy, and they look so, you know, vibrant, and they're like 19 years old. And, and then you look at a picture of them three years later, and they look like they've aged 50 years. I mean, they look like old people. So um, stress can actually be you know, really bad stress over prolonged periods of time is unhealthy. But a little bit of stress here and there can actually help us learn better and remember more easily. So this is why if you think back on what you used to, you know, like things you really remember. Do you remember you'd study for a test, you'd be a little stressed about it, then you'd go and take the test, but it stayed with you. And so um, it, it, this stress, as you prepared for the test, actually helped you remember things. So it was really a beneficial thing. Look at another way that we stress ourselves. We know that we need to get exercise. Exercise is actually a bodily stress, so we stress ourselves then we rest to allow our bodies to recuperate. 
And this little bit of stress is actually quite healthy for us. This idea that small stresses are actually beneficial in the long run is called hormesis. And hormesis also relates to things like, um, like exposure to sunlight. We often hear, oh, sunlight will give you cancer. And yes, overexposure can, but now they're beginning to find that underexposure to sun also has its own set of problems. So a little bit of that radiation can actually be a beneficial thing. And of course, we've evolved as species because a little bit of radi uh, radiation has made a little bit of change uh, through the millennia and allowed us to evolve. So when it comes to stress, though, I love how Daniel Kahneman says things. So Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize. He's, he's the only psychologist to win. He won in the field of economics. And he was a refugee as a child. And he was in the army, the Israeli army. So he's seen stress uh, both as a child, as a refugee, and also in the very stressful situations of, the, uh, of when you're serving in battle. So he said something I find so valuable, which is nothing is quite as important as you think it is while you are thinking about it. So you have your focus on something and you think it's really a big deal. So, um, you know, like I might have a, a challenge. I'm trying to put together a, a proposal of some sort and it's the biggest thing on earth to me, but really, a couple weeks later, I've kind of forgotten about it. So I like to keep in mind um, that nothing is really as important. You know, when I get really super stressed out, I'm very tired, I just try to say, oh, you know, just put one step in front of another and keep going. Tomorrow will be a different day. And it's amazing how uh, that, that stress, you can move through it if you frame it the right way mentally. And even if the way to frame it is, I'm just going to keep going somehow. I will have faith that tomorrow will be a better day or next week or next month. That's sometimes all you can do, but it works. So... Um, uh, what about students when they're learning under stress? Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. I will, um, as I had mentioned before, I've, um, yeah, I've spoken in Ukraine before the war. Ukrainians, like Guatemalans, have experienced a great deal of stress in the last, you know, well, 50, 100 years. In Ukraine, um, some five million Ukrainians were starved to death in times of plenty because the Soviet Russian regime kept the food uh, away from the Ukrainians and deliberately starved them. So Ukrainians are very aware of how, um, uh, you know, of stressful situations. It's not just the Holodomor, which was the starvation period during the 1930s. It's also things like Chernobyl. Um, this is some illustrations. This is at the, or photographs that my husband and I took when we visi visited Pripyat um, and also Chernobyl itself. So you can see here that there's the sarcophagus over the, the you know, the big Chernobyl reactor. So there was a, also a horrific period in the 1980s when uh, people were very much afraid that, you know, everything would literally go nuclear and perhaps the whole country would be uninhabitable. So, uh, so there's, you know, Ukrainians no stress. But as you can see from this picture, they also are deeply, deeply interested in learning. So I just went to give a little presentation on how to learn effectively. They're, I mean, 
the interest is, is really fantastic in learning. And that's a great thing, because it almost tells me that Ukrainians are actually aware of what learning can do that's beneficial for the brain. Now, one thing that I've noticed in traveling around the world, so uh, perhaps the Singaporeans um, say th this best. They say uh, the, the great love of Singaporeans is to complain. That is like their, their birthright. They love to complain. And when you think about it, you go, wait, but Singapore is amongst the best countries in the world. You know, top scoring, uh, very uh, clean, safe. Is it perfect? No. But, uh, you know, it's kind of better in Singapore than, in, for example, in Cambodia uh, or, uh, you know, other nearby countries. So sometimes I think that what we have is actually, um, we forget to be thankful for it. And, uh, and, and I think developing an attitude of thanks, you know, because like the Singaporeans love to complain about things. What, are your, what do students do? Students complain, don't they? But actually the learning process itself, you complain about it, but it's also helpful for you. And this is what I mean. When we're learning, we're making connections between neurons. And what's kind of interesting is the, those connections form part of the lattice of all of our connected neurons. And in years past, what they used to think was that like we, we, had, we were born with all the neurons we would ever have and they would gradually, some of them would die off and we'd get dumber and then we'd die. And it was super depressing. But fortunately, now this has been shown to be wrong. In fact, although some neurons die, new neurons are born every day, especially in the hippocampus. So what this, this is great for us because what it means is these new neurons are born every day, and, and new neurons have special capabilities. It turns out that new neurons are more flexible and they're more helpful for learning. And so, uh, so you can be 80 years old, so you, you know, but new neurons are being born in your hippocampus and those new neurons allow you to think and to learn more flexibly. But the thing is, they have to, they have to latch in to the rest of the framework if they're to survive. So, so when you are being, you know, you're learning something, either being forced to or you're just innately curious or whatever, you're really, uh, you're trying to learn something. As you are learning, it is, what is the learning process? It is hooking into that lattice. So the learning process itself is helpful in allowing those new neurons that are born every day to serve, you know, latch in and in that way survive, thrive, and grow. So the learning process is, is uh, you know, it's, sometimes we don't like it and we can complain about it, uh, but at the same time, it's helpful for us because we can learn more easily because of that, because remember, it's those new neurons. Once they latch in, they, they're also helping you learn a variety of things. But here is what is fantastic. And there's a whole field, you know, there's, everyone is studying depression. How can we help with depression? And what they found is that these new neurons actually also help us feel better. So there's something that they exude, we don't really understand why, but new neurons help us not only learn better, but actually feel better. And have you ever 
notice that you'll like, you know, you're, you're not doing anything, and then you start school. And it's kind of exciting. Lots of new things going on. You're learning things. And you start feeling like better, excited. And part of that is that new learning that is involved not only in whatever subject matter you're studying, but you know, learning about this new university you're going to. What are the new teachers like? All of these things involve new learning. And you get excited. For me, even when I just might start a new book, or I'm starting um, like a, an online class, I get so excited. You know, it's really quite fun for me to continue learning. And I think what it's doing as well is boosting my spirits. So sometimes I, I think it's important to bring up in relation to this that um, when we do have really uh, traumatic kinds of things happening, uh, it's important to uh, kind of avoid remembering them. And what I mean by this is uh, that so when 9-11 happened, so that was when the Twin Towers were brought down. It was a very traumatic experience for Americans, and especially for those who were in New York during this crisis. So, so at that time, around 10,000 therapists came to New York City to help with those who, you know, the hundreds of thousands who had experienced trauma during the, the um, 9-11 when the Twin Towers went down. And um, these therapists brought in a therapy called critical incident stress debriefing. So in this, the idea of this therapy is you sit a person down. As soon as the traumatic experience happens, you talk to them and have them sort of get it out of them, relive the experience, tell you all about it, and, uh, and in that way, get it out of your system so that you can move on with life. Well, there was, you know, so all these therapists descended to use this therapy, but there was one problem. They'd never actually done a careful study to see if critical incident stress debriefing actually worked to reduce stress uh, in those who've suffered uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And when they did study it, they found out actually this therapy made things worse. So uh, why would that be? I mean, so remember, new neurons have different capabilities than old neurons. But, but part of what's going on here is those of you who have been in my talks previously all probably have heard about the idea of retrieval practice. Have uh, anyone not know what retrieval practice is? Sort of remembering, retrieving from your own mind. This is a great way to learn something new, is to try to retrieve it from your own mind. So retrieval practice is super valuable for learning but it's actually really a bad thing when you're experiencing stress or have experienced it. If you retrieve those really stressful uh, uh, sort of ideas or uh, what the episode was, especially right after you experienced it, you're just strengthening those traumatic experiences. It's actually the worst thing you can, among the worst things that you could do. So if you have stressful experiences, do your best to get your mind off them. And in fact, it, a good thing to do is new and positive learning. If you go off and you've experienced something stressful, but you're learning about how to uh, operate a new camera, or how do you how do you write a story and do myth making? Anything. If you're trying to learn something new, which can sometimes be hard to focus on at first, but 
if you try to do this, it is really quite a, um, it, it's a blessing. It can be a real help for you. There's a wonderful book, though, called Forgetting the Benefits of Not Remembering. It's by Scott Small. He's a neuros, uh, neuroscientist. And he's also done a great deal of work in post-traumatic stress disorder. He himself was a former um, infantryman fought in one of the most traumatic battles uh, that Israel, it's a quite a famous battle. And many in his unit experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, but not him and not those who were involved in his group. And he always wondered, well, you know, I had some really pretty bad experiences. Why did I not you know, succumb to post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, part of it was, as he put it, um, they had like a, a, a couple months afterwards where his unit was kind of put aside and it was like, you guys just, you go decompress. So they drank a lot. They kind of took some drugs. Not that I'm recommending that. They... Um, they played with, so like bad things that happened, they actually kind of made fun of themselves and of the experiences. So you know how uh, they say surgeons during humor, I mean during war, they might, use, they might have this dark humor that they use, they're like cracking jokes and so forth. That's actually a way for them to reframe what's going on so in a way that they can more positively deal with it. Not that I'm recommending to have dark humor when you're, you know, having some really uh, uh, very difficult surgery to do, but uh, but what they did was they kind of they found a way to reframe, and they also had time to forget. So what is learning? Learning is making connections between things. Our memories of experiences are simply embedded in those neural connections. When time goes by, what is going to happen? Some of those neurons, those connections are going to gradually wither away. That's the way of things. So this is part of why the old saying from grandparents is, time heals all wounds. So sometimes when something really traumatic and bad might happen, if we can distract ourselves somewhat, you know, with doing anything else that, that is, you know, relatively positive for ourselves, what we're doing is we're allowing those neural connections to begin dying away. And, you know, the, of the traumatic experience or of the sadness. And time really will help heal wounds. So does it fix everything? No. But some of those neural connections that you know, are involved in really painful memories and painful experiences can kind of um, wither away, and then we can move on more elegantly into the next phase of our life. So I want to close my part of the presentation here and then you know, we're going to open it to discussion. But the way I want to close this is I actually want to bring up some, um, some ways of reframing, like cognitively reconfiguring how we think about things that are from cognitive behavioral therapy. And this therapy is, it's, there's a lot of research that shows it's that, you know, 10 years of Freudian psychotherapy is in many cases nowhere near as effective as maybe six weeks of one hour or, or uh, per week sessions with a really good cognitive behavioral therapist. What does this therapist do? They can allow us to reframe what we're thinking about to help us move on in a more positive way. And this reframing can actually lower the stress we feel. There are, there's a part of our brain 
that actually goes around and it says, um, what's going on? Am I feeling very safe? If I'm feeling pretty safe, let's, let's put my systems into good normal states. If I'm feeling unsafe, it will, uh, there's actually like a computation and it will continue to emit all these stress uh, hormones that over the long run can be very un, you know, unhealthy for you. So what are some of these uh, cognitive tricks of reframing yourself that actually affect how your body is emitting um, some of these um, hormones that can be good in small amounts, but not so good in long term? The first is we often say, well, uh, I'm either going to do the best in the class on this test, or I'm going to be the worst. Um, it, it's I'm going to be successful, or this person is going to love me, or they're going to hate me. We, we often frame things in terms of, you know, it's, it's either going to be the best or the worst <laughs> of things. But if you try to look at it more objectively, you know, a lot of times there's something in between. You get a B on a test. Is it that bad? You know, it, nothing in, it, in life is as important as you think it is at the time you're thinking it. And also, there's this tendency of us uh, to overgeneralize. I'm always so stupid, um, you know, or uh, I can never be the best at something, you know, what I'm trying to do. So we, we, we sometimes use these um, common categorizations that actually can make us emit stress hormones when they really don't need to be. There's also, there's a mental filter. So when you hear good things, you're like, yeah, yeah, right. But when you hear bad things, it's like, yeah, I know that, that's really true. So you hear the bad things, but you won't really absorb the good things. I mean, there is a flip side of that because uh, some people, only hear the good things. And they ignore all the bad stuff and they think they're the best. And this is Dunning-Kruger syndrome, or at least related to it, which is a syndrome where you're kind of so oblivious and kind of so stupid about things, you're not even smart enough to figure out that you're wrong. And so you think you're right. <laughs> so, you know, there is, there can be a flip side but I would suspect that not a single person in this room is a, um, is a Dunning-Kruger uh, exemplar. So, you know, just try to watch. Are you mentally filtering? Are you absorbing whenever bad things are said, but, you know, just kind of ignoring the good things? Because this is going to negatively frame things, and your, little, your body will start emitting neurochemicals based on your cog cognitive framework that you are using. So this is very much related to discounting the positive. You, whenever you hear something positive, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 you ignore it. So also what we often do is we, uh, and I'm a champion at this, is I'm like, oh, he's not going to like this. I know what he's thinking. He's thinking blah. And a lot of times, he's not thinking blah at all. We can often just like jump to conclusions about what other people are thinking. And many times, we are wrong. And no matter how often it happens, we turn around and then we can do it again. So realizing how common this is and that this is a very common framing uh, pattern can help us to, to begin to understand, oh, well, if it's that common and I'm seeing it self, in myself, maybe I can actually try to find ways to uh, avoid this kind of thing. Or at least uh, in this kind of, um, so the, the book I'm drawing this from is called The Feeling Good Handbook by David Burns. It sold millions of copies. And what he recommends, is that, so I have this list of common um, sort of mischaracterizations, conceptual uh, fallacies, and he says, 
write down what happened, like in a, a phrase, then write down what conceptual fallacy this falls into, and then try to write what the real objective truth is. So, you know, as far as if you make yourself step back and do that, and what, he, what they find is this simple approach can help you start feeling so much better that it's kind of remarkable. And this is what they sometimes call bibliotherapy, which is therapy from simply reading a book instead of going to a therapist. And it works. It it's really can be very helpful. So other things are magnification, uh, the binocular trick, and that's like, you know, something maybe you did a little poorly on this one section of the exam and you're, you blow it all up. It's like, oh, I did so terrible on this exam. And it's actually one, you know, one part of it or one little aspect of what you did. So, uh, so for example, for me here, speaking at all these presentations, the, I'm, the audiences are remarkable. But if I'm not careful, I could just sit there and say, yeah, but a, there was this one person with one question, and maybe that one question meant that, you know, they didn't really uh, get a lot out as much as, so I could, out of hundreds and hundreds of people, you could home in on one person and then use that to make yourself feel bad when it's really not an objectively honest thing to be doing, and it's certainly not healthy for you. There's also emotional reasoning. I feel really bad, so I must be really bad. This is so easy to do when, uh, and it was a good lesson for me when I was learning to videotape things. Um, I would be petrified. And I'm filming and I'm looking at the camera and I'm thinking, oh, I'm terrified, so I, I must be, Everybody must like feel that I'm really terrified. I know I'm really awful, and then I'd start messing up because I've tricked myself mentally into messing up because I have this feeling. But then I eventually found, you know, people can't tell how you feel. And so if you just carry on anyway, they actually, I get all these, you know, like one time I, I had this terrible migraine, and people will write, and I remember when I was filming, I was like, I feel horrible. This is really awful, but I've gotta put this out. And people will, they write me, one of your very best videos is this one where I really felt terrible. Um, people often simply don't know. And in the same sense, you can react from your emotions in a way that can be really detrimental, but you don't need to. Don't follow your emotions. Try to put those, do the Zen thing. Let those emotions flow past and try to be objective in how you're, you're handling whatever might occur. So uh, sometimes we'll say, the world should be this way, or I should have done this. If you catch yourself using the word should, step back because that probably means you're being overly critical of yourself. And uh, lastly, labeling. Use it, it's, it's kind of like that idea of, um, you know, uh, I always am so stupid or something like that, but calling yourself uh, stupid or calling yourself, you know, oh, I'm, I'm so bad at public speaking all this kind of thing, that actually can, again, get that little part of your cognition that is involved in figuring out whether, whether to emit these random, or these types of hormones that can be unbeneficial. You know, labeling helps trigger some of that stuff going on. I should say, do you know that when I before I even taught my first class uh, ever, I was so afraid of public speaking that I actually had to go see a therapist 
because when I tried to speak in front of audiences, my voice went like, like this because I was so nervous. And I had to first address the problem of how do I speak in front of audiences so you can actually hear me. Um, and what I found was, of course, see, if you get really, really nervous, so you can see I'm not as nervous now at all. In fact, I feel very comfortable. It's like uh, flight time on an, uh, uh, on an airplane. You get enough flight time, even if you were very nervous in front of audiences. After a while, it's like, oh, these are my friends. I'm home. And so, uh, but, so when you get nervous, your vocal cords tighten. And this is a special problem for females because our, our voices are naturally higher anyway. And when our vocal cords tighten, we tend to get a little bit like this. And we can get a little shrill like a chipmunk. So, uh, so sometimes um, politicians, especially female politicians, will go to voice, voice coaches to help them to learn how to keep their vocal cords relaxed. Um, if you, like Margaret Thatcher, the great uh, British Prime Minister, she took voice lessons. A lot of, um, a, a, a lot of, there's a wonderful one called, let's see, uh, it's, it's a, uh, an article about politicians in Singapore who take elocution lessons and they can, you can tell beforehand, they'll show uh, videos of what they sounded like and then afterwards they sound sort of a little bit uh, lower register, a little bit more commanding, a little bit less childlike because child, children have a higher register. And it actually is a little easier to listen to. But um, more than that, if you find yourself in a stressful situation, a very good thing to do is to learn to breathe from the belly. So wh what I mean by that is when we, so we have fight, flight, right, or freeze. And those are the three stress responses that, you know, when we're typically stressed out. So if you're fighting, you've got all these neurochemicals that come out and you're gonna, you know, it's very, it's stressful from that perspective. You're fleeing, you, you equally have all these um, hormones that allow you to more quickly react and, and flee. But freezing, what freezing is, is when you're in a really stressful situation, think about it this way, um, if there's a, uh, like, you can point to a bird and you say, hey, look at that bird. But no one can see the bird until the bird moves. Even a slight motion, your eyes hook right onto it. So when you freeze, you're actually making it so predators can't see you as easily. And so our tendency, if we're getting this freeze sort of thing, is we breathe really shallowly. So shallowly that we're not really, our, our chest doesn't rise, we don't move. But when we're like really stressed and we're just, we're, we're, we think we're breathing in the same way we normally do, but we're actually only breathing a little bit to the top of our chest. And we're not drawing air all the way in and our body is not getting enough oxygen, so we go, I'm public speaking, I, I'm totally stressed, I, I can't, you know, and you think it's because you're publicly speaking, but it's, in reality, it's because you're having this, this freeze thing, and you're not breathing enough, and you're not getting enough oxygen, and your body interprets that as, I'm terrified because I'm in front of an audience. If you simply breathe in more deeply, it can make an enormous difference. You can actually relax in front of audiences and it works really, really well. So th the whole idea is, so let's see if we can maybe do this together. So what I want you to do is put your hand on your belly 
And it's hard for me to walk through and do this while I'm also doing it myself. So what you want to do is breathe in through the nose if you can. Breathe in and your lungs go only down to maybe around here. But if you breathe in deeply, what it will do is actually the lungs will push against the stomach and the stomach will go out a little bit. So try to breathe in. So we'll go breathe in, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. And that's the kind of breathing that you're trying to do is a slow, deep, that's making your belly kind of stick out a little bit so that you get that air all the way down. So when you really are stressed from some sort of thing, ah, I'm going in for a job interview, I'm not sure I can actually speak, you know, try this deep breathing a little bit beforehand and that will help prevent that <gasps> panic at the last minute. So uh, I, uh, those are sort of my thoughts, my guidance, uh, my ideas as far as, well, not all my ideas at all. These are sort of uh, influences and findings from all sorts of great body of literature that I think are helpful for us to be aware of to help us handle, you know, um, stressful times, stressful experiences. And I guess what I'd like to ask is, you know, do any of you have particular little um, things you do, you know, as a, a trick that helps you with stress, either long-term, short-term, or anything of this nature, you know, that you would care to, to share with the audience. I think what we should do to begin with, though, is let's have uh, five minutes where you introduce yourself uh, at your tables and kind of brainstorm some ideas. Uh, and then when we're done, so listen to the people at the table and if there's a really good idea, someone else can volunteer that person. But no, feel free to just share amongst yourself. Let's take five minutes on your mark, get set, go. Okay, so I think we are, uh, we are probably ready to, to rejoin. So, I'd like to ask, uh, does anyone have something they'd like to share? Some thoughts? Please be here. Yeah. Well, um, I do many of those <laughs> frequently. <laughs> You're like the happiest person I know, so you can already see that uh, if he does these kinds of things and looks well, the at bad them. Things. <laughs> oh! I do labeling. But do you, are you aware of them? <laughs> Almost, yes, yes. Well, the thing is, what works like charm for me is breathing. Yeah. And changing, I, I call it changing channel. So mm -hmm. whenever I am stressed in the long term, I, I cook, so I cook. Whenever I, I am very stressed, I go and cook. I want to just be your friend and hang around you because I would benefit. <laughs> you will. Oh. Multiply yourself. Okay. <laughs> but breathing and changing channel, yeah. it works very well for me, very good for me. Breathing, there's so much evidence. There's a wonderful book by, I believe it's Mark Nestor, called Breath. And he, it is one of the most amazing, he just talks about using breathing and breathing techniques to help relax you during times of stress. And certainly, uh, my wonderful husband, he um, spent, what, close to 18 months in Antarctica. So you're all like, he was on, what, a, an eight-man station? Um, you're out by yourself. The, the nearest people are, are well over a thousand miles away. You have to learn to kind of be one with yourself, to, to be happy with yourself. And so a uh, big thing he does is, is breathing. And he's always, when I get stressed out, he's like, okay, 
breathe, you know, breathe. Uh, so this box breathing where you breathe, you know, in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, breathe out for a count of four, and then, you know, hold for a count of four. This is box breathing. And this can really help slow you down. It, and it ties right in with the autonomic nervous system, which controls like heart rate and all these kinds of things. So your breathing is intimately related to how stressed you are. And, um, and if you can just watch your breathing, you can do all sorts of things. So yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yes. So I'm here, I teach critical thinking, and we saw strong connections between your, uh, your strategies and fallacies and cognitive biases, which are in errors in our reasoning. And, and, and when we explicitly teach our students how those work and that they're all susceptible to bias, they're more aware of how to develop metacognitive strategies to counteract those you're bringing up such a good point. Have, oh, do you know the name of the book by uh, Lukianoff, uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff? And it, it's about how these strategies, and I didn't miss one, which was personalization and blame. You know, oh, it's my fault, or it's, you know, um, when it, maybe isn't your fault at all. Um, he talks about how modern US society, instead of um, trying to make you aware of these, to avoid these logical fallacies, it's actually encouraging us to, um, so for example, um, you know, there's, there's all this labeling going on in politics now um, that, and, uh, you know, when somebody says something wrong, it'll be magnified and, uh, you know, people will become canceled. And that society itself has moved into this, you know, uh, it's actually encouraging this kind of behavior. Um, and, and that people should be thinking emotionally. In fact, lately I've been looking for emotion or papers, neuroscience papers on uh, how important it is to kind of not be emotional when you're trying to think critically. And you know, it's really hard to find papers because all the papers now are like, oh, you know, emotion is such an important part of our thinking and so forth. And it is, but if you do want to think critically, you do have to try to approach things dispassionately. So um, I almost, I, and there is some evidence that those who are um, really deeply into um, certain forms of politics where these kinds of behaviors are encouraged are also really more, uh, that depression is much more prevalent amongst those. So um, I, it's funny, I'm working on a MOOC now on critical thinking. So it's, the, it's critical thinking with insights from neuroscience. Um, and there's lots of really good insights. You know, what is deductive versus abductive versus inductive? How do we, um, you know, how do we argue by overturning someone's, you know, basic um, premises? Um, and uh, it's... Uh, there's a lot of emotional thinking going on when, uh, you know, when people are th trying to think critically, and it, it does really make it hard to, to think critically. So I think there's a very close relationship to um, trying to be more objective, to be more calm about things. And this is, you know, I'm always of mixed feelings about uh, meditation myself, in that. Um, a lot of creativity comes from that default mode network, the diffuse mode, and that's also a source of great anxiety. So, you know, it's almost like you get rid of one, or 
you know, and maybe you're getting rid of the, getting rid of anxiety at a cost of creativity. But there is so much good from meditation in insofar as um, being able to step back and look more objectively and dispassionately at things without getting all wrapped up in emotional thinking. And I think that's a really healthy um, thing for us all to aspire to. You, we all have read stories here and there about the, the dispassionate monk who's able to you know, uh, resolve situations because of their dispassion. Uh, and um, it, it is a very good thing. So, yes. Sorry to go on. Yes. How did you repeat the name of the book you mentioned? Um, which, which book? On the, um, how modern U.S. society is. Oh, okay. So it's it's by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Did did you get the name of it? Someone. It, it's their most recent. I, what was it? The coddling of the American mind. Yeah. It's a really good book. And it might be appropriate for your work, too, in critical thinking. Yeah. More ideas. I can share something. OK. That comes, as you said, with breath and also exercise. For me, yoga, uh, practicing yoga has been like something that I can't go without. And I've noticed how my mood or my how I can think clearer and have better emotional regulation when I do it and when I don't, even if it's, it's not directly related to thinking or the cognitive part. It's really interesting. They, they, they've struggled, I think, to find good research literature that shows that meditation improves our ability to learn, but yoga there's actually some really good studies that shows it, it helps our ability not only with you know mental health but also improving our ability to learn and and I just wonder that it might have something to do with you know your your controlling your body as well and it's the breathing because it's the only exercise where breathing and movement has to go together um, with other exercises, breathing is important, but for this, is like, it's timed with the breathing, so it has to do with both, I think. Oh, wow. Now you're inspiring me to want to take a, a yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> what are, you know, there's some of the, um, you know, the movement, the slow movement, and I'd love to, there's some pretty good evidence that that is also beneficial. So, and there's also beneficial evidence that mountain climbers that you know there's something about I think you have to control your breathing as well as your body movements but maybe it's a self-selection process oh that's right in fact there's a paper that just came out um, on wellness and nature from in a big journal um, and I still I'm always a little suspicious because it's kind of like we want nature to be, um, you know, health-inducing. So I, I, I made a mental note to look more carefully at that paper. Um, but um, there's something about the visual form and so forth that you're exposed to when you're in nature that just makes you feel happier. So at least that's what... But they've also had pro a lot of problems. For example, all these meditation studies have come out showing how wonderful meditation is for you. But then when they really stepped back and some people did careful meta-analysis of thousands of these studies, they found that um, like 98% of them were conducted by people who were meditators themselves. And they had real methodological flaws that, that made it a lot easier to find positive results. And when they threw out a lot of the studies because of these methodological problems, um, the ones that remained didn't have very strong evidence for meditation. But I, I do think that, you know, uh, there could well be something of, of real interest. Certainly, uh, it, 
I, I think it helps you to become more aware of emotions when they are arising so that you can, um, you know, at least put a, you know, name to that emotion and say, I'm doing labeling, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking emotionally or whatever. Okay, more thoughts. Yes. Uh, I try to like fake my body language because when I'm nervous I get slouch and like I close up so I try to stand straight and this is weird but I go to the bathroom and I start like doing power poses <laughs> yes <Right>. yeah <laughs> and, and and there was a there's been contentious arguments over the last 50 or 10, 15 years about power poses and whether they really help. And the final consensus is they, they probably do help some. So uh, I, I think it's a great uh, approach. Um, I, I will sometimes go off before a talk and, you know, in the privacy of the bathroom, you can kind of, okay, get now. You know, and, and relax just a moment and and put on, you know, oh, you know what my husband often tells me? So there's there was a very famous comedian called Joan Rivers. And she she was so outgoing and so and so my husband will sometimes say, Okay, time to put on your Joan. You know, uh, because the reality is when you're um, you know, when you're sharing with we, we all want to be energized. Uh, we certainly don't want to have a speaker who is putting us to sleep. So, um, uh, you know, it, but uh, I sometimes tell the story of um, the, um, there's a, a restaurateur named Guy Fieri in the States who does a television show. And when Guy goes, so he will go to like rural restaurants out in the country and he is, they basically do a show about this restaurant and how it's really helpful. You know, it's got great food. You know, they make super hamburgers or, you know, chili mac or, you know, whatever. But he will go two weeks before they film and he just meets everybody and he's a really normal person. But then when he goes on camera, the two weeks later, he is bigger than life. He's really, you know, very, and I do think that sometimes when you're, especially when you're speaking for the camera, you need to be like, you lose 10 charisma points for, you know, just because it's going through the lens. So it's a good thing to be, um, you know, outgoing and power pose ahead of time, even if it's only mentally good. I think that's a good approach. Okay, other thoughts? Uh, here on our table, I'm going to share three, um, but one was uh, visualize ourselves in a safe place, oh, yeah. and that would be the first. Uh, the second one uh, is being grateful and make a list of, of the great things that happened to you on, on the day. And, and probably the third one is kind of hack your, your brain and your inner space um, while in a stressful situation, if you're hearing something really bad, kind of block it. I mean, hear, but do not listen. Do not take it or keep it on yourself in your inner space. That's, that is a really good idea. Because especially um, if you are actually doing something, you will always find critics. Um, and, and sometimes you'll find critics who are like, you know, sometimes it's a big number, sometimes it's a small number, but you tend to focus on those critics, even when it's only one or two people, and they can really be painful. I mean, like deliberately going out of their way to twist the knife. So I, I, I really admire public figures sometimes because I feel like they, um, you, they really have to get a lot of crap thrown at them. And, and you after, I think after a while, you just learn to tune out. 
and the good politicians are able to tune out, but still, still somewhat receptive to both the negatives and the positives, which is, you know, it can be painful to do that. Um, you know, it's much easier to only listen to the people who are your fans. Um, and uh, that's, so that's a really good, I think those are a great set of insights. So we had more, okay. So the, the trick I shared is, um, so I'm, I'm a photographer and whenever I take a portrait, usually uh, people are very tense or you tell them, oh, do a pose and they're like maybe a little bit awkward um, because, you know, they feel um, weird because of the camera. So what I do is I make them jump three times and that relax them, so like they make them feel very relaxed and then they pose very naturally. And then there was one, there was this time I, I was giving like a conference and I was very nervous. I get very nervous whenever I talk in public and I saw the audience was a little bit, you know, like sleepy and so I thought, okay, I'm, I need to do something to make me feel relaxed and boost this audience. So I make them all jump three times, <laughs> but it was more like for me to relax and then they were all like all awakened and so I think, after that, I, I thought, well, this is a really good good tip. Mm -hmm. That is a great tip, actually. So we should have done that here. Uh, <laughs> except you were all pretty excited and interested as it was. So I was lucky here. But that is a great, great tip. Uh, um, I think there's something, too, uh, just about movement that really is helpful. Uh, um, there is, so one thing that i found is when you are doing public speaking, if you focus on the audience and them learning instead of your own internal turmoil, you're more interested in helping them. What happens when you're thinking about your, your turmoil, your own self, is you're actually kind of in them using that declarative, deliberative thinking. But if you start thinking about the audience and outside yourself, you, it, it really reduces stress. And they often, they will say things like, like when I used to be in the military, you, they, you were supposed to um, be one with the target you are aiming at, not focusing on your breathing and so forth. And I think focusing external to yourself is a really, it helps you relax. Um, you'll get more, you know, because if you think about yourself, you'll miss the target. But if you think, if you're one with the target, you're thinking outside yourself, you're actually using a very different neural system, more the basal ganglia habitual system, and it's a lot easier to just relax and think. So um, I, I, it was funny, I, I talked with one of the, the greatest public speakers in, um, in Southeast Asia. And I said, do you ever get nervous? And he goes, yeah, I do. But I really try to focus well on the audience, you know, focus on teaching them instead of on myself. And it helps me to relax. And public speaking fears, I think, are, are big for everyone. So, you know, that's a good place to learn relaxation techniques. But getting outside your own head, thinking about someone else, that is, that's very helpful to reduce anxiety. So all of these are good things. And what you were do, really doing, you were, you were getting outside your own head in some sense. You know, you're looking at it from their perspective a little bit. Uh, that so so creative. More thoughts, yes. Um, more than a thought, I have a question. But this is very useful, and and I do use a lot of breathing in in moments of, of when I'm nervous. Also with my kids, when when they're yeah emotionally on a high, I'm like breathe, breathe. I also I also have I, I bought on Amazon meditation cards for kids. But it mixes breathing, so it obviously uses breathing, um, the four, the four 
that you mentioned. So I helped them a lot at night, especially. But then with the forms of fooling, I find myself doing a lot of these. So what can you share with us on how to stop or train the brain <laughs> not to go to these forms of fooling? So a good thing is to keep a diary. So you have a day-by-day -day journal. Um, take a picture of this, write down at the front of it what these common forms of fooling yourself are. Then each day, as you might have something, you know, journal at the end of the day and say, uh, today what I was doing was, in, in, like, in the journal put, um, you know, uh, like a line and then a line. So then you end up with three columns. In the first column, you put like a brief phrase, like, um, my boss was very angry. And then, um, then you put um, perhaps personalization and blame, and also mind reading. Because, you know, uh, uh, because what you were doing was when your boss was very angry, you were like, oh, it's something I did. You know, you're blaming yourself and you're mind reading. And, and, and then you look, uh, and in the right hand, you write um, something like, um, the reality is my boss had a really bad family situation at home. And uh, it is almost, you know, it's very probable it had nothing to do with me, that that's, you know, why. Or maybe I did mess up a little bit, but it actually, I was catastrophizing and making it worse than it actually was. So in other words, you write what the occurrence was, then you practice, you're practicing putting a mental name to the behavior you're using, and then you're practicing looking more objectively at what it actually was. If you use this approach, you, um, that's sort of the, the bibliographic approach. You know, this is what books teach about how to do cognitive therapy. It is almost as effective as going off to see a therapist. I mean, it, it can be. Um, so I highly recommend that book, The Feel Good Therapy. Um, Feeling Good Handbook by David Burns. It's a really, really good book. Um, and he talks about, for example, the birth of his son um, and how his son was really, really sick and then he was catastrophizing. My son is going to grow up with all these challenges and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and of course, he was actually stressing himself out for something that turned out to be, um, to not actually happen. And so often we get anxious about, and um, that's part of what our default mode network does, is it, uh, it imagines different um, possible ways things could unfold, and it likes to imagine really bad things. So that's a way of beginning to train yourself to better understand these uh, little cognitive fallacies that you can fall into that are so common. Oh. I know I'm feeling nervous. Uh, so being aware in the moment of what's happening. So uh, am I magnifying this? Or like she said, she, she got this, the, the strength uh, postures, uh, poses. So it's like, okay, what am I doing now? So being more aware of the moment and the situation to to respond in a different way. Yeah. I think, and you're exactly right, part of what journaling will do is just give you practice, uh, you know, so you're analyzing retrospectively each day, but then that can help you so that even at the time it's happening, and you're exactly right, at the time is, it's happening is when you really want to be doing this, but a little practice beforehand seems to help uh, as well. And there's this whole cognitive you know, thing that we're doing. Um, and if we are able to reframe, we can actually reframe really bad things as really, you know, and handle them much more effectively. 
I, I, I know one woman, and, uh, and she, she told me her, her mother was dying of cancer. And I said, oh, that must be really hard for you and your mother. And she said, no, you don't understand. My mother was a hospice worker for years, and so she helped people to be able to handle dying. And now for her, dying is just like, it's just not a big deal. She's not worried about it. And, and y y you don't understand, it's, it's really handled differently in this family. So even death can be reframed in a way such that it's not as you know, um, heartrending as, as it, it often can be for many, um, which I thought was really fascinating. Okay, other comments? This side has been rather quiet. Something I like to do for the magnification specifically is a gratitude wall, wherever I'm living at the moment. Um, I label it gratitude wall and ask, what are you grateful for today? Mm. And it helps me really go back into my day and pick out what was good about it. Because usually I'll be like, oh, this one thing happened that that sucks and it's ruining my whole day. And then when I go back and fill my post-it for the day, uh, I realize things were much better than I thought. So it's having it like, I guess you can do this with a diary as well, but having it in your wall is always prompting you to do it. So yeah. I like it. That, I think that's so important because like, like let's say that you lived where they were building the Brooklyn Bridge across, you know, when they first got the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, across in New York City, it was so, everyone was thrilled. It's like you could easily get back and forth. You don't need boats. You're doing all this stuff. And then after a while, we take it for granted. And, you know, look at this university around us. The design is unbelievable. Who, who designed this thing? How lucky are we to be sitting in a building that's climate controlled, that has these beautiful vistas, you know, and then looking out at what's going on, that we're sitting in chairs, that we're breathing and able to breathe. Um, and, you know, uh, it does make me laugh because we all often work to make the, the lives of people better you know, through education or through lots of, you know, helping our kids and so forth. But then we take for granted all the people who have gone in the past before us trying to also make our lives better, not even knowing us. So I think developing and cultivating this attitude of gratefulness for, you know, for life and for what's around us and for what all the other people have really given us is a really healthy thing to do. And I think today I'm gonna be like, and I need to practice this more so I'm not like a, like a Singaporean who, you know, who has it really good and they do and they're brilliant. And sometimes I think you can, you know, when you have it better, it's almost easier to complain about things. Uh, um, so, great comment. Well, I, I think, let's see, any last comments here? Uh, with this, I would just, I, I would like to thank you so very much for this. Um, it's been really uh, an extraordinary few weeks for my husband and I here at UFM in Guatemala. It's, you, you're doing fantastic work and we are immensely grateful that you brought us here and allowed us to share and learn from you. Thank you so very much.